verse 11. I'm reading this morning from the King James Version. Follow along. And it reads, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we would henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But we speak the truth in love, that we may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You may be seated, may the Lord continue to bless the reading of his word. The realization of living in unity. You remember last week when we were talking, uh, we had basically said that uh, what God wants from us as children of God is to live in unity. I find that interesting because we are various uh, and different creatures with different viewpoints. Uh, some of you out there are Dallas fans. Some of you are Redskins fans. Some of you are Eagles fans. Some of you are other people fans. It doesn't matter what team you like, we still can get together under the guise of unity. Some of you are Trump supporters. Some of you aren't. It doesn't matter who you voted for. We still can get together under the guise of unity. Some of you like worship music. Some of you like traditional gospel music. It doesn't matter what type of music you like, we can still all get together under the guise of unity. Well, Pastor, with all those different things you mentioned, and I'm sure there's many more you could have mentioned, true, how can we be unified when we are so diverse? The key to our text, as we learned last week, is that unity is not based on our likes and dislikes, our preferences, but unity is based on how we view and see and follow the Word of God. As long as you and I are on the same page when it comes to God's Word, we can be in unity. Don't matter about the other stuff. Because when we're on the same page with God's Word, when we are unified around God's Word, then that means we walk the same path. We talk the same talk. We believe the same thing. And so what we found last week is that because of the gifts that are given, because God has given us gifts, and the gifts he's given us are not gifts to make you uh, psychic, uh, not the gift of money, but what God does is he gives us people. He calls people gifts. He says in verse 11, he gave to some apostles, to some prophets, to some evangelists, and to some pastors and teachers. What God does is he gives these gifts that are people for the purpose of growing us, for the purpose of showing us where we're wrong. And let me say this to you, that when God gives these people, and notice it says he gives some to different people, take the personality out of it. Because a lot of times we only adhere and heed to folks whose personalities we can get with. If they don't jive with our personality, if we think that they're, you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, 
that we have a tendency to turn a deaf ear to what they have to say. But the key is, we talk about being unified under the word of God, the key is I listen to not who they are and what they have to say, but I listen to what they have to say and is there any truth to the word of God about what they're saying. And if they're speaking the truth of the word of God, then it doesn't matter about their personality, it doesn't matter about who they are, as long as I can hear that word and gain something from it. And so what we find is, is that God has given, uh, uh, hasn't given gifts in this essence to individuals, but he has given individuals that are gifts to the church. So we talked about that and we talked about, uh, uh, if you will, the description of these gifts. He gave uh, all of those folks for the perfecting of the saints. We talked about uh, how he, th these people are in our lives to make us better. Um, folks rub you the wrong way for a purpose. Hey Amen. I know you didn't like that. Folks rub you the wrong way for a purpose. To make you better. If I'm rubbing you the wrong way and you get angry, don't be mad at me. you got an angry problem. Amen. If, 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 if I didn't have any buttons that were active, you couldn't rattle me. But it's, it's that person in your life is showing you that your buttons are still active and that you need to do something about it. And so we have some gifts that God gives individuals to perfect us, perfect the saints. And then we learn that they also gave these individuals to promote the system, the work of the ministry. I'm just uh, going over it real quick that we are in ministry, uh, and all of us should be in ministry. Don't just sit on the premises, but get involved. Uh, find your niche. Um, I've discovered in the church there is something you can do. Amen. Can I say that again? There is something you can do. Don't allow the fact that you think you don't pray right, you don't read all of your Bible, uh, you don't know a lot about God. There's something in the church you can do. Do. Even if it's just smiling, shaking a hand, and making someone feel welcome, you've got purpose in the church. And so he says he gave these gifts, these individuals, for the perfecting of the saints, to make us better, for the promotion of the system, that's the work of the ministry, and then to prosper the saved, he says, for the edifying of the body. We need to make sure that as a child of God, I'm growing. And I'm not the same when I first got saved. That at some point in my life when I got saved, I moved a little bit higher. Amen, somebody. That uh, I'm prospering in my salvation. I'm prospering in my uh, walk with Christ. And, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but let me just talk about it right here real quick. And that simply means that as I'm prospering, as I'm being edified, I'm growing and moving away from some stuff that God's not pleased with. And, and notice the words I'm using, I'm moving away. I haven't moved completely. I still got some issues from the pulpit to the door. So never look down on anybody. Never look and say, well, I'm better than you because I've done this. No, we all got issues. And matter of fact, some of us hide our issues better than others. But the point is, I'm being edified. I'm growing. I'm moving away from issues. I've only did one cuss word today. Yesterday was five. I'm growing. Are you with me here? And so we found out that we, uh, uh, we had unity because of the gifts uh, that were given. But today I want to look at we have unity because of the glory that is gained. Because of the glory that is gained. There's a story of a Christian man who was stranded on a desert island for many, many years. When the rescuers found him, to their surprise, they also found that the man had built three buildings in the years that he was deserted on this island. When they asked the man what were the buildings, he said, well, that first building is my house. That's where I lived. The second building was my church. That's where I, I worship. He said, what's the third building? He said, that was the church I used to belong to. Uh -huh. No, you didn't get that? All right, let me try this one. So there was a plane crash. And on the plane, there were six people, two Jews, two Muslims, two Christians. And 
Thankfully, they all survived. After some time, the Jews decided to build a synagogue. The Muslims decided to build a mosque. But the Christians each built their own church. Still ain't got it. Some of us will start a church and not even like the church we start. And have a need to find another church. We are so into us that unity is foreign to us. We want a church that does it the way we want to do it, how we want to do it. And then you get sick of you to the point where you got to build another church. I've always said that you're not going to find a perfect church. And if you find it, don't join, because you're going to mess it up. But we all have opinions. We all have ideas. We all have ways that we believe will work. But what unifies us is the word of God. That is the thread or the common denominator that flows through the church. If we don't have the word, we don't have anything. Everything we do is based on the word of God. Everything we seek out to accomplish is based on the word of God. Not our opinions, not what we think, not what we've even seen other people do and we're successful at, but it has to come from the word of God. And so while we find that unity comes because of the gifts that are given, unity also comes because of the glory that is gain. Look at the text in verse 13. You'll understand where I'm going. He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Here's our unification. Our faith and the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Not how we baptize. Not how we worship. Not how we sing. Not how we do business. It's all about our faith and our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come unified to the point where we become a perfect man. And let me throw this in, the word man there is genderless. It's a perfect people. Perfect man, perfect woman, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This glory that God gets out of our lives is when we can get together and be unified over the word of God. The problem is we fight even over the word. And, and the reason we fight over the word of God is because we try to stress our point to support our mess. We want to do stuff. So we want to get a word to support our stuff. Uh, I read the word that Solomon had, uh, you know, uh, 300 girlfriends, 700 wives, 1,000 women in his life. And we want to go ahead and follow Solomon and say we want multiple girlfriends and multiple wives. Well, any man with a thousand women in his life is probably crazy. I see some of the brothers nodding. Because some of the women that you have in your life now, or the one man, amen, gives you fits already. Love you, baby. But they give you fits already. Because you can only handle one woman. Amen. Ain't it too many. But here he says that uh, we need to become perfect to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we, we get this unity because of the glory gained. What do you mean? Look what he says. Let me break it down. He says, first, this unity reflects the bond of glory. It reflects the bond of glory. The unity of the faith. Spiritual unity in the church only comes from two sources. There's the truth and love. The truth is the word of God. Love is the love of God. Unity comes through those two sources, the truth and the word of God. These are twin virtues which come from the heart of God. And the truth of the matter is, listen, truth and love cannot operate without each other. Let me make it clear. Truth 
without love is hard and judgmental. I just got to let you know. And I come and I let you know. But behind me letting you know there's no love. So you have a hard time accepting it. It becomes hard. It becomes judgmental. Matter of fact, you probably fight that. Well, who are you? But you get out of my face. Who are you to judge me? And then what we normally do in defense mode is begin to pick apart and find out things wrong with the messenger. Y'all got quiet. You ain't no better than me. Why? Because we've given hard truth without love. On the other side, love without truth is condoning and enabling. In other words, I see your mess, but I love you anyway without telling you about your mess. That's a problem. Because basically, I see you going off a cliff, but I love you enough to let you go. Something's wrong with that. So love without the truth is enabling. It, it presents and produces no change. And so when truth and love have come together and joined hands, and they work together in unison, then what that does in the life of the believer is it produces growth. See, I have to be willing to be told the truth about me. Can I be honest? Nobody likes to hear the truth about themselves. From the pulpit to the door. I got to check myself sometimes. When people come to me and say, Pastor, I need to tell you something about you. Okay. <laughs> I gotta check myself. Because automatically, like in Star Trek, shields up. I go into defense mode. But I gotta listen. I've gotta take it to heart. I've gotta understand does this person really love me? Or they have to hurt me. And if it's done in love, I can receive it, I can respect it. And so when it comes together, when love comes together, it produces growth. Because the truth of God's word by itself utterly destroys us. i got to tell you, the word will kill if it's not mixed with love. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Uh, 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 I believe the scripture says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God. Greek word, dudamus, dudamus of God. Translated, it's the dynamite of God. Are y'all with me here? See, when the word gets in you, it blows stuff up. It breaks stuff up in you. The word is powerful. And it can hurt you. But when love is mixed with it, it can, it's an easy demolition. I wish I had help here. See, sometimes you blow stuff up and it goes everywhere. But with the right setting of the explosive, the stuff or the strongholds will come down easily. Are y'all following me here? And so the truth of God's word, when it holds hands with the love of God, then we are spared imminent destruction. And the principle applies even within the functioning of the church. Too much love without truth produces a mess. Are y'all with me here? If you were in Bible study Thursday, we talked about Corinthians chapter 5. In Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church. And he says to the church, he says, I have heard it has been uh, commonly reported among you that there is uh, some stuff going on in the church. More specifically, there's a man in your church who openly is sleeping with his father's wife. Here's what he means by openly. Y'all know about it. Y'all know, they, they come in hand to hand. They sneak out together. They've been seen together. I wish I had help here. Amen. And y'all know about it. He says, but instead of mourning it, you've been puffed up. Instead of dealing with it, you have allowed it to occur. What you're really doing is you love this dude, but you're allowing him to kill himself. Because he's doing something that is ungodly. And so God says, you've got to deal with him. What happens when it comes to unity, my love for you says, i got to help you and deal with your mess. Because I'm condoning it if I allow you to continue. And so the bond, if you will, the bond of glory 
is when we come together in that unity and in that perfection. Can I talk about that just for a minute? Because the word there, when he talks about perfection, he's not referring to being perfect. But he's talking about growth. He's talking about uh, uh, coming to a point, a principle where you grow in grace. None of us are perfect. And none of us will be perfect until we get to heaven. Because we're going to be just like him. But what he's talking about is a movement towards perfection. See, there's a movement towards perfection. There's a movement uh, towards detriment. And so what he says is that our goal here, the bond, is that we become uh, 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 perfect, uh, growing in our glory. The bond of glory is when the unity of the faith operates in the heart of every member of God's church. Then he says, not only do we reflect the bond of glory, that's the unity of the faith, but look at the next part, he says, to the knowledge of the Son of God. To the knowledge of the Son of God. Not only does it reflect the bond of glory, but it also reflects the beauty of glory. When you look at Jesus, everything's right. When I look at Christ, everything's right. The beauty of the glory of God shines through who Christ is. Pastor, what's that mean? That means, watch this, that if Christ is in you, I should see Christ in you. Which means it brings out the beauty in you. Not the ugliness, not the madness, but I begin to see who Christ really is in you. In other words, he simplifies it for us. He says this, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. I'm the focal point. I'm the center of attention. I'm the intellectual and emotional uh, uh, capacity of everybody in the church. In other words, nobody in the church gets the glory but me. That's Christ talking, right? He's the reservoir of our wisdom and the treasury of our knowledge. And when we begin to get close to him and understand who he is and really focus on him, I tell you, things change in our lives. We begin to see things differently. Stuff don't bother us like it used to in light of who Jesus is. Things don't really get us down like it used to in light of who Jesus is. Because man discovers the source of life and its purpose and its destiny when it understands the beauty of the glory of Jesus. Let me see if I can help you. Uh, uh, um, an old movie, uh, uh, I, I, I forget what it was called, that fast. But um, I forget what it was called, that fast. 60, thank you, amen. I'm blaming everything on 60 right now. Uh, but uh, the actor Chris somebody and the Chinese guy, I can't think of it right now. Chris Tucker. Rush out. Thank you, thank you. Those who remember that were probably younger than 60. Okay, I'm sorry. But Chris Tucker, when he first, first meets uh, Jackie Chan, getting off the plane, and he says, uh, he introduced himself, and he says, Do you speak English? Jackie Chan don't say nothing. And he says, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> right, y'all remember that? Yeah. And that kind of reminded me about how God and the beauty of who Christ is. You know, everything God does reflects Jesus. In the Old Testament, everything God did was pointing to Jesus. The ark was a type of Jesus. The skins to cover Adam and Eve. A sacrifice had to die. Blood had to be shed. A type of Jesus. Everything he does in the Old Testament, God points to Jesus. Showing us that the one who is really the beauty of glory was soon to come. And then during the times between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they called it the silent years. 
where God stopped talking because they could actually hear God audibly in the Old Testament. God would speak, things would happen. God would talk and people would respond. They could hear God audibly in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. And in those silent years when God stopped talking and they couldn't hear from him and people wondered what could we do. And then when the Old Testament ended and the New Testament began, God decided to speak again. This time as God spoke, the words of his mouth started to come out. And as the words of his mouth came out, J-E-S-U-S, -S, before it could hit the ear of the believer, he wrapped it in flesh, put it in a manger, and called him Jesus. And now, not only do we now hear about the beauty and the glory of God, but now we witness, Lord have mercy, the beauty and the glory of God. And then to make things better, after he lived and died and rose again, now through the, the Holy Ghost, the beauty and the glory of God now lives in you. Now, I'm going to mess with you, so here it is. So if the beauty and glory of God now resides in you, child of God, how do we do some of the stuff we do? How do we form our lips to say some of the stuff we say? If, if, if the beauty and the glory of God resides in you. See, notice this, he says, to the knowledge of the Son of God. The phrase implies that we need to desire to know God more. That's why uh, Paul, when he writes to the Philippian church, he says this, that I may know him. I need to know him in an intimate way. And, and, and the question this morning is, what do you know about Jesus? Amen. See, what is it that you can reflect on that keeps you straight? What is it you can uh, uh, think about that keeps your mind right when it comes to Jesus? We know about his character. We know about the fact that he was tried. We know that he was tempted. We know that he was proven. We know that he is a, a substance we know that he's the personalization of every Old Testament prophecy, and he's the realization of old, every Old Testament record. He is royal and regal. He is the beauty of glory. And all that he is, he takes a residence in you. See, church is more than joining and getting involved. Church is living. Living a life that's in you. See, if I'm a whoremonger and that's in me, that's the life I live. If I'm nasty and mean and cantankerous and it's in me, that's the life I live. If I'm a, 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 a cheat, a stealer, and a hustler, then that's the life I live. But if I'm a child of the living God, and Christ lives in me. That's the life I ought to live. And contrary to popular opinion, we can't live that life. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. I'm not where I should be right now. It doesn't appear what I shall be, but I do know this, that when he appears, I'm going to be just like him. Which means he's soon to come, so I'm one step closer to what I should be. Amen. Not two steps backwards to what I shouldn't be. So notice what he says. Notice what he says. It reflects not only the bond of glory, not only it reflects the beauty of glory, but look what he says. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It also reflects the body of glory. See, Paul says concerning this mystery of the church that the imminent arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ is soon. And because it's soon, we've got to conform to who Christ is. Our spiritual life, listen to me, is reckoned as a Christian journey that has a destination. And that destination, believe it or not, 
does have a completion point. In other words, God saved me because he's taken me somewhere. And one day I'm going to get there. But he's not talking, listen, about my final destination of being heaven. He's discussing my final completion in my glorification. See, some of us are waiting to get to heaven to be glorified. God says, I want you glorified now. Ooh, Lord have mercy. You ain't gonna like me. I'm going somewhere. See, I know, you know, when, when I get to heaven and I get my glorified body, I'm going to be glorified. No, God says there's glory right now. And I want you glorified right now. Well, how can that be? You ask great questions. Look what he says. He says, he uses three words. Unto perfect. Y'all see that? Now, I said it earlier. Being perfect does not mean sinless. Being perfect does not mean you don't have problems. Being perfect, he's talking about in this particular text, talks about showing some evidence. The word perfect in the Greek is actually defined as adulthood or being mature, full grown in the likeness of a full grown adult. The only evidence we can display to those around us is that our life, our spiritual life, is of a full grown adult. See, it's one thing for you to tell me you're an adult, but you act like a child. I, I, I've got issues with that. I, I find that to be different now. Because as an adult, I act like an adult. I do things that are adultish. A five-year-old cannot say they're an adult. All you got to do is watch them. And you can discover that a five-year-old is not an adult by their actions and their mannerisms. And so, basically, our walk needs to line with our talk. Amen. And can I just say this? Just because I really want to make this clear, as clear as possible. Get the tape. Watch it on YouTube later. It's going to be on YouTube. Being an adult doesn't mean age. Amen. See, I know in Jewish uh, 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 belief, you reach a certain age and you become an adult. N not in Christianity. It's not about age. It's about accumulation of growth. See, I can be 15 and be sold out for Christ. While somebody can be 50 and be a sinner. Are y'all with me here? It's a learning process. It's a, it's a leaning process. Where as I grow, oh, thank you, Lord, I lean on Jesus more and more. That's how you know you're growing. When everything you do, you lean on Christ. Y'all getting quiet. Let me see if I can come to a conclusion, but help you out. In Bible study, we ask the question, for those who might want to come to Bible study next Thursday. And we said simply this. We said, you know that as a Christian, we're supposed to be lights of the world. Which means we're examples. Our light shine before men. If they want to see Christ, they look at us. So here's the question we ask. Does your dress reflect how you feel about Jesus. Now, now somebody pointed out to me, that goes for men too. Right? Does your dress affect the way you feel about Jesus? Now, why did I bring that up? Because while I'm growing, and it's a learning process, it's a leaning process. What does that mean? That means as I grow, I lean on Jesus for everything. Mm -hmm. So as I look through the closet, oh, here's a better one. As I walk through the closet, and I don't find anything in this one, so I go to the second walk through the closet. Right? I should be leaning on Christ. Lord, if I put this on, will this bring glory to you? See, without me leaning on him, I look at that dress and go, I'm bringing glory to me. Girl, you look good in that thing. Brothers, there's some stuff we 
we ought not wear. Amen. 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 Uh, I know you're muscular. I know you got a body that stops traffic. Oh. You're welcome, Deacon McDonald. But do I bring glory, or am I bringing glory to myself? It's a leaning process. I just mentioned dress. Is it anything? Do I lean on Christ, or do I do what I want? Amen. Look at the second part, second word. Here it is. Look what he says. He says, until a perfect man, until the measure of the stature. Can I use the word stature here? The word stature means enclosure. First there's evidence, then there's enclosure. Meaning what? It means there's a time frame in which we are placed for the purpose of growth. Now, when I say there's a time frame, there's a physical time frame, which can be the span of your lifetime, where God has allotted us a span of time in which to grow and mature. What are you saying, Pastor? He's saying this, tomorrow's not promised. See, uh, when I hear people say, well, I, I ain't there yet. I ain't perfect. Uh, I got, you know, I still got some growing to do. Okay, granted, but please understand what you're saying when you say you're not perfect. What you really mean, according to what we just read, you're not an adult. You're not spiritually mature. See, don't, don't use that as an excuse. Don't use that as an excuse. Don't tell people I'm not perfect. That means you're not spiritually mature. And then secondly, there's a time frame. I'll get there one day. Maybe. Because tomorrow's not promised. See, no, you still ain't caught it. Here it is. I love y'all. Listen. If I continue my mess, God could cut short my lifespan. He's given me time. Oh, Lord have mercy. I heard E.B. Hill. Some of y'all don't know who E.B. Hill is. Look him up. Great preacher. He has passed since. He preached a sermon. Why is Jezebel in hell? Great sermon. Look it up. Why is Jezebel in hell? He went through the whole litany and life of Jezebel and the things she did. And how she came up against uh, the prophets of Baal and had it all in, and all, you know, came against the prophets of God and all that. And he talked about everything Jezebel did. And after each thing she did, he would say, but that's not why he's in heaven. And then he would talk about something else. He said, Jezebel did this. And you know, Jezebel, for somebody to have a name in the Bible, Jezebel, how many folks would name your daughter Jezebel? Yeah, amen. Nobody. Right? So you know she had a wreck. And he would talk about Jezebel and say, but that's not why she's in hell. And here's why she was in hell. He would read this in the book of Revelation. It says, because I gave her room. Translated, I gave her time to repent. That's why she's in hell. I wish I had help here. See, it doesn't matter what you've done or what you're doing. God is long-suffering to the point where he gives you room or time to get it together. But you ain't got all time. Stay with me now. God will cut it short. That's why when he gives you the opportunity, when he gives you the room, when he gives you the time, take advantage of it. And can I say this to the men? I don't, I don't, I'm not letting this here to the women, I'm saying this to the men. You ain't a punk because you serve God. I don't know if you think because your reputation or people look less at you, you ain't no punk because you don't serve it, because you serve God. Stand tall. Be a man of God. Let them know I serve God. No, I'm not doing that. No, I ain't gonna do that. No, I'm not gonna do that. I serve God. If you lose friends, you lose friends. God will bring other friends into your life. Are y'all here with me? He says there's a stature, there's a purpose of our growth. Uh, uh, the emphasis here is not to waste time but to redeem the time that God has given us. Our Lord had need to utilize the time frame allotted to him. You know Jesus only lived to about 33, right? So in that time frame, knowing that he didn't have all day, he had to do what God called him to do. Listen, I may not be here next Sunday. I don't know. God may call me home. Hallelujah. That's why he told me to stand tall and tell you today. 
And then told me, don't be afraid of their faces. He said, and if you get afraid of faces, close your eyes. And we'll preach it anyway. Stature, time frame. Y'all with me here? He said, it's the enclosure. It's the reflection of the body of glory. God is trying to get us. And then he says this. Here it is. Watch this. He says, and then there is the effect, the fullness. Look, look, look at the rest of the verse. He says, the stature of the fullness of Christ. The word fullness means in the body of believers that are filled with the presence, power, and riches of Christ. Now listen to me. Filled with the power, presence, and riches of Christ. What, what is that? The power, presence, and riches of Christ has nothing to do with accomplishment. It has to do with accessibility. In other words, we're not looking at success, but we're looking at submission. Oh, you missed it. How do I know that I've got the power and the presence and the riches of Christ? Because I've made myself accessible to him. Ooh, Lord have mercy. We easily can say no to Jesus and yes to our boss. We easily can say that ain't important, priorities, but other stuff becomes the priority. Yes, See, I know I've got power in God when he has access to my life. Yes, Will you drop anything for Jesus? Will you give up anything for Jesus? Yeah, amen. It's the pushing out of the carnal, the pushing out of the worldly desires, and it's the placing of Christ in your life and being dedicated to who he is. Lord Jesus, amen. He says, we need to understand that glory is gained when we show evidence. That's our, that's our growing up. You know what the biggest compliment is when somebody says to you, hey, you didn't get angry. No, I didn't. You grow. Thank you. That's a compliment. You ain't gonna eat that last piece? Nah, don't eat it. Grown. Yep, I am. You ain't gonna drink it with us? Nah, don't eat it. You think you're better than me? No, they ain't gonna, they ain't gonna compliment you on that. Growth, evidence, perfection, enclosure, stature, time frame. God says, I put you in a box so that you can get ready. Everything that happens in your life, God has ordained it. Amen. Listen to me. Especially if you are a child of God. I don't understand that. You mean God has sent these misery and pain? Yeah. Why? Perfecting. Growing you. Making you better. Not to cut you off, not to make you mad, not to give up on God. He's making you better. He's strengthening you. And then the fullness effect, which means that I begin to reflect and do the things of God to the point where he has access to my life. I submit to him my all in all. I give him my all. Because of the glorious gain. Why do we, why do we, why do we have all of this stuff in our life, this unity. Because God is working us to become more like him. We'll pick it up next week. Uh, 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 we'll find out next week and we'll close it out. Uh, verse 14 and 16. And I'll read it to you, but we'll pick it up next week. Because God does not want us tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Now, really come next week, because some of y'all really not going to like me, because some of the folks we listen to on TV toss us to and fro. We get caught every wind of doctrine. And we need to understand what God says. Uh, uh, you don't eat everybody's chitlins. You sure don't eat everybody's potato salad. Why do you listen to everybody's word? No. 
Man, if I really help you, I'm done. At least you inquire who made the potato salad. Without tasting it, you know who made it. You know it might be all right. 